The Batman Arkham game series is one of the best game series of all time, and in my opinion, the single best superhero video game series ever made. Although I must admit, Insomniac's Spider-Man series does give it a run for its money. But Rocksteady Studios redefined the superhero game genre when they made Arkham Asylum, and the games only got better as they went along, culminating in Batman Arkham Knight. And although the game had a bit of a rough launch on PC, and I know some people have some mixed feelings about it, personally, I think it is an amazing game with a kick-ass campaign and a great set of DLC. And it also has a huge amount of Easter eggs, references, and secrets. I mean, Rocksteady really went to town on the details with this game. So much so that even after literally dozens of playthroughs, I'm still finding new things in the game to this day. And this video is going to go over 20 secrets, easter eggs, and just cool things that you have never noticed before in Batman Arkham Knight. Let's start with the Riddler part of the game. This is where the Riddler has Batman solve several puzzles and challenges in order to get key cards to unlock the explosive collar around Catwoman's neck. But if you look closely, you can see that the Riddler's puzzle key lights spell out Batman, which really hammers home how fixated the Riddler must be to do this. Although considering he constructed several underground giant arenas and racetracks, I suppose it's not actually that surprising. And when you first go into Wayne Tower to meet Lucius Fox, there's actually a small bus statue at the other side of the room. It's the same as the one in the clock tower, and you can pull its head back and bat gadgets will rise up from the floor. Specifically the disruptor that you get later on in the game, which Lucius Fox will actually take out and give you a little explanation of. Although sadly he says that it won't be ready till later in the night, so you can't actually get it until Nightwing gives it to you, but still, it's kind of cool that Batman has this in his office. And after you've captured the militia officer, the one you interrogate and then break his arm, well, later on in the GCPD cells, he'll be all mouthy and yell abuse at you. And if you go over and stand by his cell and let him finish with this abuse, Batman will actually knock him out. And the second time he's being mouthy, later on in the game when you're walking through the cells, you can do the same and Batman will then take a swing at him, and the guy will trip over himself in fear, trying to get away from you. And later in the game, when you're taking down the escaped Jokers, and you're hunting Johnny Charisma, there's a point where you need to enter a security code. But if you keep entering the wrong code several times, then eventually Batman will get fed up, and just punches the lock open with his fist. He is in a rush to catch a Joker after all. And when you're hunting for Barbara Gordon after she's been kidnapped, there's a point where you go through security footage to track the car that she's in. And if you look closely at one point, you'll see that the serial killer's ass actually walks right by the camera. And later on, when you find Barbara Gordon, and she's in a cell and gets Scarecrow toxined and shoots herself in the head, a scene which we later discover was actually fake, well, there was actually a way of knowing this was fake all along. You see, the Joker, who is of course an hallucination himself, picks up the gun on the table, the gun that Barbara supposedly shoots herself with. So if he's able to pick up the gun, it means it's not real. So if you're actually watching that scene carefully, you would have known all along that she wasn't dead. I mean, most of us probably guessed it because it didn't really work for the plot, but still, there was actually evidence there from the beginning. And I guess what actually happened was that Barbara was just sitting in the cell while Batman, whom was also on Scarecrow Toxin, just freaked the hell out and then flew away. And during the flashback scene where Joker shoots Barbara Gordon in the spine, the Joker is actually wearing a hat that says flashback on it, which does seem in keeping with the Joker's sense of humour. And you can also use detective mode in the game on Barbara Gordon and see that her spine is broken, which is not only quite cool, but also looks very painful. And as for the Joker himself, if you look closely at him, you'll notice that as the game goes on, he looks better and better. When we first see him in Ace Chemicals, he is as rotten and diseased as the Joker who was in Arkham City. But slowly with each appearance, he gets healthier and healthier, having less and less rashes on his face. And at the end of the game, he looks like the normal Joker. And I think this is a subtle way of showing the Joker getting stronger throughout the game inside Batman's mind and getting ready to take over his body. But personally, I never noticed this until I played the game about six or seven times. I don't know how, but somehow I missed it. And the Joker, of course, is voiced by Mark Hamill. And if you look closely at his name, it literally spells the word Arkham. Now, this has nothing to do with the game, of course, so this doesn't really count in this list. But when I first noticed it, I thought it was kind of cool, so I thought I'd share it with you. 
And there is also more to Joker's hallucinations than just seeing the Joker walk around. Lots of statues and pictures all around Gotham City either have the Joker's face on them or turn into dark Joker-themed jokes. And these actually flick back and forth as you're playing the game. You can look at a statue and it's normal, look back it's Joker, look back again and it's normal. They change showing that Batman's mind is slowly being controlled by the Joker and that he's losing his grip on his sanity. Of course this does depend if you're playing it on console or PC because this does take a lot of runtime, so this doesn't always appear on everyone's playthrough. But if you look closely you should see it at some point throughout the game. And going back to the very beginning of the game, you play as Officer Owens and are among the first to be fear toxined and you get attacked and beaten unconscious by a bunch of monsters, who are of course just the cafe's customers going nuts. And you can shoot a few of them before they take you down. And if you do, Owens will later in the game be filled with regret and remorse about it, and he's going to lose his job and having a bit of a breakdown. But if you don't shoot anyone, then although it's obviously still a bad situation, it looks like Owens won't be fired. He just needs to go through some psychological evaluations before he can be a cop again. And this also changes things when Owens is locked in a cell, sweating out the fear toxin. There's two different things that can happen. If you haven't shot anyone, then the other cops are all impressed and can't believe that you didn't shoot anyone, what a great guy is, and things like that. But if you did shoot the people in the cafe, then all they talk about is how bad they feel for the guy, and how Owens is just going to be so depressed about what he did. And I actually think this is quite a nice little touch, how it can change depending on what you do. And funnily enough, the only reason I found this out is because when I was playing through the game once, I nipped to the bathroom at this point because I knew he was going to be killed, so I figured I didn't need to do anything. And that's when I found out that if you don't shoot anyone, you get this different scene, which I thought was kind of interesting. And if you remember the waitress at the beginning of the game, and the guy who comes up to you asking you to deal with a guy who's smoking, well both their bodies can later be found at Elliott Memorial Hospital when you're doing the Rachel Ghoul mission. And the actual director and writer of the game also appears at the beginning, and he is just in the diner getting dinner and walking out. He's not there for any specific reason other than the director decided to put himself in. And I don't blame him for that. I mean, I would have put myself in the Arkham series if I could, and I'm sure you would have as well. I mean, why wouldn't you? And after you confront Scarecrow for the first time in Ace Chemicals, if you look closely on the floor, you can see that he has discarded his old Scarecrow mask. I think this is just a subtle way of saying the old Scarecrow is gone, and this is a newer and deadlier Scarecrow that you're dealing with now. And when you blow up the Penguin's stash of guns, there is a glowing sign above the vault that says Iceberg Lounge. But after the explosion, the only letters that are still lit up spell the word C-L-U-N-G-E, which is a word with quite a dirty meaning, and it could be a coincidence, but more than likely it's a dirty joke that one of the developers managed to slip in. Now, throughout the whole of Gotham City, there are lots of criminals and thugs who are just generally rioting, robbing, and creating havoc. But if you look closely, you'll see that some of them are actually just playing catch and throwing a ball back and forth and having a bit of fun. And others are exercising and doing some sit-ups. After all, just because you're on a crime spree doesn't mean you miss your daily exercises. And if you look very, very closely at the missiles that all of the automated tanks are firing at you throughout the entirety of the game, you'll actually see that they have the word Deadshot written on them. And this is of course a reference to the Deadshot character and the fact that he always hits his target. Now this could be that Deadshot has a company that sells these, or maybe it's motivation to hit Batman with the missiles. But most likely it's just a little easter egg that the developers decide to stick in there for a bit of fun. And during the Professor Pig mission, you rescue several people. And one of them is a girl who actually has her own missing persons poster at the GCPD. Which personally I really like because it shows a close attention to detail. And there are also other GCPD posters that are actually of the developers of the game, with humorous little notes on them. Such as Sarah York being known as the Marshmallow Thief, who was born in your nightmares and is built like a boss. And after you beat up the criminals in the city, if you look very closely at them you'll notice that they actually bruise and bleed. You can actually see their faces take damage throughout the fight. Of course, this is only if you're looking closely, and if the console or computer that you're playing on can actually handle it. After all, if it doesn't have a good graphics card, then this doesn't happen. But if you do play on PC with a good graphics card, you can actually see them start to bleed throughout a fight, which I think is an amazing attention to detail. And at the end of the game, when Batman returns to Wayne Manor and his mansion blows up, Calendar Man can actually be seen in the crowd. 
which is a little reference to the Arkham City game, where Calendar Man says that he was there at Batman's beginning and that he'd be there at his end, which, as it turns out, he was. And that is 20 things that you never noticed about the Arkham Knight game. Of course, I'm sure some of you already know some of these. Hopefully there was a couple that you didn't, otherwise the title kind of lied, and I apologise. Though hopefully some of them were new to you. If so, please let us know in the comments which ones were new, along with which one of these is your favourite. And especially let us know if there's some other interesting secrets in Batman Arkham Knight that you know of that I didn't mention on this list. And I'd just like to quickly remind everyone that we have some merchandise available on our store, and to say thanks to all of you who have donated to the Needle Mouse Productions page on Patreon. And as always, thanks for watching, and feel free to subscribe, share, like, and comment.